Ollie, we've we've had a bit of a roller coaster today. We were texting before or earlier today, and we said we were both pretty flat initially. But after a few hours have passed now, I think we've got a bit bit more perspective about how things have unfolded. Yeah, definitely. When all the trades came through at the last minute on deadline day, everyone just left at the last minute. I think we're both a bit in shock about what happened. It seemed like we completely folded at the last minute, but. Yeah, I think having a few hours to digest the whole thing, I don't think it's as as bad as we initially thought. But, yeah, yeah, it's not perfect, and I don't think you'll ever get a a perfect trade period. But, yeah, we're going to have to see what happens there. It's it's hard to really think now what it's actually like. Like, we're probably going to have to wait a couple of years, especially with Josh Shackey, and he's just the, the great unknown. Like, he's just... He has a lot of talent, but it's just his mind and um, application that mm. might end up holding him back and, and definitely did it lines. Yeah, it's a bit funny. Like, the media sort of race, races to, you know, give a verdict and judge your trade period. But I think trades and draft are sort of, you look at in re- retrospect and say, oh, you know, that was a good year for us or, you know, this panned out pretty well. I don't think you can sort of... <clears throat> take an instant reaction now like it kind of contradicts itself in us doing this podcast and talking about it but I think in a few years we'll get a better picture and understanding of how things took place today if that makes sense yeah definitely right I think at the time going back to 2009 when we brought in Brendan Favola that was seen as a, a definite win for the Lions and yeah. Carlton had been screwed over but <laughs> In absolute hindsight, we completely lost out of that and it totally set the club back mm. so many years. We're just trying to cover it from it now. So, Still, yeah. yeah, it's um, one of those things, drafts as well. Like you can have the highest draft picks and everything like that, but no guarantees are going to turn out to be a great player as Josh Shackey's proved at the line, number two draft pick. And mm. yeah, he's left after two years, which is very, very disappointing. We'll get into that in a second. I think the only firm, solid, hot take that I can sort of gain from this whole period is that the trade period and the free agent period is just way too long. Like, this could have all been done four or five days max, I reckon. Like, how drawn out and prolonged this whole period was. Like, at the end there, it was just a joke. Everyone trying to get things done that have sort of been, you know, earmarked and talked about for probably weeks now. Um, yeah, you're dead right. I think there just has to go back to the trade week. Mm-hmm. Like it's turned into this trade period where it's basically two weeks now. Yeah. And yeah, as you said, it was just an absolute joke today. Everyone filing reports at the, um, the last minute. It was because like even at the start of the day, there weren't many trades going through, and then in the last hour or so, everything seemed to happen. So mm-hmm. this could all been avoided. Like there were days there in the trade period where literally nothing happened at all, and. Journos were just sitting around. People on Twitter were just like, "What's what's happening? Why are we doing this?" So, I think the AFL definitely have to look at it and go back to just yeah, a few days. But uh, I guess they want the AFL continuously in the spotlight. So, yeah, drawn right. out period like this, it, it suits them and keeps them in the media. Because after now until the draft, it's going to be a bit quieter. So, um, it was really like as if all the list managers. Were uni students so just like the total last minute yeah. mind frame, just oh shit, you know, gotta gotta lodge the assignment, gotta get the paperwork in. It was just chaotic. But anyway, we'll move on from that. We're gonna start by talking about what we gained in this trade period. So the big big game for us is which we sort of telegraphed back in I think it was May we first talked about it with Mike Whiting, it was Luke Hodge joining the club for a few a pick swap in the forties, so we went ended up with forty four and we sent Hawthorne 43 and 75. Yeah, so it's essentially pick 75 we've got Hodge for, yeah. which was always going to happen. It was always going to be a late pick, and you saw what Hawthorne yeah. did with Jordan Lewis and Sam Mitchell last year. They were just happy. Well, Hodge had retired, so it was a bit different to Mitchell and Lewis last year, but, yeah, we're always going to get him for, for not much. But, yeah, super recruit, and credit to you kegs and obviously mike whiting brought this up a long time ago and it's actually come off so i think it's just brilliant and all the fans are really excited it was pretty weird seeing him in a, a lions jumper saying how Very excited strange. he is to, to join the club and yeah. can't wait to get into the preseason it was almost a, a surreal experience really watching that but um yeah I, it's just great to have his leadership at the club and i'm sure 
he'll bring more off the field than, than on the field. He's, I think he's still going to add a lot on the field, even if he does only play 14, 15 games, but just his mm-hmm. leadership and his experience and just, I think, just lifting the standards at the club is just going to be really important. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think he made the example that, you know, Fagan only gets to pass on a message at the quarter time or, you know, during the reviews on Monday, but getting to have that live, you know, by the minute um, feedback and assessment is just going to bring the group along in leaps and bounds and particularly that defense. They're going to improve so quickly with Luke Hodge back there. It's pretty exciting. Um, as you said, strange to see him in the Lions jumper for the first time. So I haven't got used to it. It's on my screen at the moment and still freaks me out a bit. But um, I think the thing that did catch me a bit off guard about this whole deal was the fact that it's a two-year playing deal. I yeah, I was pretty certain it was going to be like a one year, then maybe multiple years as coach. But yeah, straight off the bat, two-year playing deal. Um, whether that eventuates, like I think Sam Mitchell might have signed for two with West Coast. Don't quote me on that, but only ended up paying one. Um. So who knows? We'll see how his body holds up. But at the end of the day, we've got him. It's going to be a huge boost for us. And yeah, this this move was brilliant, I think. Oh, definitely. I know there are a lot of sceptical fans at the start, but I think it was just more trying to get your head around a, a retired champion coming out of retirement and playing for the Lions in, mm-hmm. in a different jumper. But oh, it's, it's brilliant. And it's going to lift the, the profile of the club. Uh, tremendously, especially in the media in Melbourne, and I think crowds are going to be lifted. Membership will be up as well, and just yeah, having someone who's played in four premierships, he's been captain of the club in such a successful era. Mm-hmm. Played um, under Fagan, obviously Fagan was football manager and was there during those uh, premierships as well. So it, it's just going to be brilliant for the club. I think it's just such a, a great thing for. Um, for us as a club. The other name we brought in this off-season was Charlie Cameron. Um, There's a lot of angst over this deal, dating back to when Fagan sort of speculated it during the season and Don Pike took offence to that. And then even during the trade p- period, it wasn't always friendly publicly with their managers, well, Cameron's manager being pretty vocal and Justin Reid being a bit of a bit of an ass about things at times. But... Um, uh, that's uh, putting it lightly. <laughs> we got the deal done. We paid pick 12, which I still think, even after a few hours, probably a bit excessive. I would have been perfectly fine with 18, even 20. 18 was probably my limit, but I still think 12 was a reach for Charlie. 12 definitely was a reach for Charlie. I was pretty bloody annoyed when that <laughs> came through. At the last minute, they were going to... Um, give up 12 for him because there were reports going around that it was it was completely off it was yeah. not going to happen this year and I thought beauty like I'm willing to wait until next year when we can just absolutely screw Adelaide over getting for nothing potentially in the preseason draft but yeah 12 I didn't really like but you look at it uh, the 12 pick we got for Hanley last year from the Suns and if you look at it that way mm. it's basically a swap Hanley for Charlie Cameron, which that seems really good because Hanley's on his last legs. He's had so many injuries and uh, he, he was yeah. great for the club. Stuck around during those um, really tough years and feel really sorry for him. I really loved him as a player, but mm. yeah, he's probably just bodies letting him down there. But Charlie Cameron, um, 23 years old, he's played 70 odd games. He's played in a, a pretty successful team, so yeah, hopefully he can bring some of what he shows at Adelaide to, to hear and more. But, yeah, that prelim final against Geelong yeah, was electric. an absolute superstar. Five goals, I think. And, yeah, we'd love to see some of that from Charlie. So I guess those who aren't so familiar with Charlie is sort of, you know, that really uh, good defensive pressure player, you know, great with the tackling and sneaky goal kicker. Sort of like, I guess, you know, in the Eddie Betts mould. But it was interesting listening to Dave and Noble on Trade Radio at some point this week saying he was a player that we looked at going through the midfield a lot and that was sort of the next stage yeah. of his development. So, yeah, looking at having a lot of pace through the midfield when you think about Zorko and the like going through there. So going to be exciting times at the Gabba and it was something actually no one mentioned as well that the Gabba plays really fast, which I think we yeah. we recognise as fans. 
always Definitely. sort of get a lot of free flowing footy at the Gabba. So um, yeah, it'll be one to watch. I think potentially Charlie coming off the back of the square at sort of centre bounce time as well, flying yeah. through the midfield, It'd be pretty exciting. But yeah, great pickup for the club, especially when you spin it as out Pierce Hanley in Charlie Cameron, irrespective of pick twelve. That's uh, the way you have to spin it. We're yeah. all annoyed the way Adelaide dealt with it. Like, <clears throat> seriously, trying to get a first-round pick next year. And they tried at some stage to get Dane Zorko, which is absolutely <laughs> bloody ridiculous. Like, just taking the absolute piss. Like, they just had an absolute mare of a month, Adelaide, losing the grand final and then just they just imploded. Just yeah. the way they reacted to things. Jake Lieber and um, Tex Walker just... Paid through the teeth for Bryce Gibbs as well. Yeah, they sure did. But, um, yeah, in the end, I, I think we paid overs. It's mm, a bit disappointing, but... Especially yeah. when he said himself, you know, look, in 12 months' time, I'm walking to Brisbane. It's something yeah. that we could have pretty much just gone through the preseason draft and got a freebie for. Yeah. I think that when you look at it like that, it's pretty frustrating. But, you know, time will tell. As we said at, yeah. the, at the top of the podcast, we'll look back in retrospect and think maybe, you know, genius or we'll think like, you know, Fev 2.0, this was a disaster. But don't go too hard just yet, I think, is is the angle to play. Um, the other deal think, was... Yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, I think I just would have loved the club to just make a statement, just yeah. to say we won't be bullied <laughs> by these clubs. And there's a lot of talk going around today because Gold Coast got... Royally screwed in the, the Lucky Weller trade just because mm. a player wanted to, to go to the Gold Coast. So they paid ridiculous overs, which I don't uh, know, I don't know I how, don't know how that, that will ever come out to be a good thing for the Suns. Like, mm. I think you can say that now. That's never going to be a good trade for the Suns, giving up pick two and everything like that. But yeah, I would have loved the club to just go, no, fair enough. You're not going to take, we've offered so much and you just keep throwing this back in our face and mm. putting up laughable offers. Just, nah, screw you, we'll get him for free next year. But anyway, we'll move on. Um, the other deal we did at the deadline was a pick swap with Richmond. So I think it was about 20 and 25 for 15 and something in the 52 it might have been. Um, so I guess the gist of this deal was getting in front of a bid for Connor Ballenden. So I think the club's expecting a bid yeah. around 18 to 22 is my guess based on what they've done. Um, and so then they've got 40, 44 and 52 in the back end as sort of points to put towards him. Um, so it puts us in a position to have picks 1, 15 and hopefully 18 before anything with Connor happens. Did you like that move? I suppose. Yeah, I did. Lo- so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I did like that move if we can get those three picks in before having to go for Ballenden. I think that's a great move. And by all reports, I haven't seen him play or anything like that, but Ballenden's a, yeah, a really good player and a Queensland kid as well. So mm. we're not going to have the, the go-home factor there. So if you can get three picks in before that, I think that's a really good move for us. And it worked for Richmond as well. They wanted the, the father-son in Patrick Nash. Yep. So it worked out well for both parties. And, yeah, I think it's a good move. I think what's really interesting and a tad frustrating is how long this whole, pe- how prolonged this whole period's been, and yet now our whole sort of off-season pans on if a bid comes for Connor before that pick eighteen or after it. It sort of that yeah. shapes how our whole, whole off-season looks, I think. Because if we have to spill the points before eighteen, suddenly it doesn't look so great. But anyway, no, um, it doesn't at all. We'll move on to what we lost. So it started with Tom Tommy Rockley from free agency moving to Port Adelaide. Um, the talk is that pretty much it was the long-term security of a fourth-year deal compared to what Brisbane was offering for three years and probably a bit more money as well. That probably swayed him over the line. Um, yeah, it was. It was definitely that. It was the. It was the money. It was the long-term security. He's going to be twenty-eight, um, not too far away, and yeah, a four-year deal for a twenty-eight-year-old. Only unheard of mm. to be honest um yeah and i think the reports are going up to about 650 a year mm. which i think i guess rich is on probably somewhere in that vicinity and i think we probably did pay overs to, to keep some of those guys a few years ago and uh, i think rockcliffe probably would have seen that but 
yeah, it, it's disappointing to lose him. He's been there for a long time. He's never played in a final. He's um, been captain of the side and really looked like he was turning his um, career around this year after mm-hmm. all that turmoil and trade talk last year. But, yeah, I think it wasn't a bad thing, but I just – the whole thing around the the compensation for free agency is yeah, just an absolute sad. joke. And Noble put it perfectly, a great description. It's just secret herbs and spices yeah. from the AFL, which is absolutely spot on. Because Motlop somehow was a, a first re- end of the first round compensation pick as well. Mm. And you can't possibly say that Motlop is in anywhere in the same class as, totally. as Rockcliffe and won't be getting paid the same amount either and I was going back to three years ago with James Frawley at Melbourne yeah. and he was all Australian in 2010 but no best and fairest Rockcliffe's got two mm. um, yeah and Melbourne got pick three for him then so it is just a, a bit of a basket case with that for ages in conversation I think like if Motlop was worth pick 19 or whatever it was as well yeah I think we should have got a lot more for that. but Well, that's the thing. Like, You look at the free agents, I think the compensation for Rockcliffe was right. The compensation for Trengo was probably right. It's just Motlop that they got wrong, and it really sucks. It probably hurts us more than any other club in the comp to see that. Like, Oh, yeah. You know, the other clubs probably don't care as much, but for us, it's a huge slap in the face. Where we're like, hang on, how, how does this work? But anyway... Um, it is sad, as you said, to lose Tommy, someone, I think there's a lot of, uh, romantics in all of us that probably wanted him to, you know, one day lift the cup or whatever and play finals with us and lead, lead us back to the top, but, um, it's not to be, um, it is a bit of a shame. I, there's a part of me that thinks, you know, you've been pretty well paid for most of your career. You've been paid overs to stay in Brisbane during tough times, which is fair enough, but, you know, maybe respect that the times have changed a bit now and but I suppose he does have a family to look after and, and whatnot and he has to do the best by them and you know you're only playing footy for what 10 13 years or whatever you've got to make it count while you can so you can't really I think be... that's what it is just the times have changed I, mm. I think I put up a tweet last week saying people draft after about 2013 and if they stick around at the same club for 13 plus years they should be knighted because yeah. it just won't happen like clubs are going to come with big big money deals mm-hmm. and it's just the landscape now it's not uncommon for guys to change clubs and just with free agency and like contracts not existing now mm-hmm. it just creates this landscape where it's just so easy for players to move and we're already seeing that um, the angst over Rockcliffe has probably calmed down a bit now, but there was definitely a divide amongst the fans initially when things went down. So there was a lot saying, you know, Brisbane, stump up the money, pay up. And there was a lot saying, you know, Rocky, take it or leave it. Where did you sort of fit in that discussion? Did you think the club should have maybe put up a bit of more of a fight to keep him or were you happy with where how they played it? I was really torn. I was I kept going from one camp to the other, yeah. but I think in the end, four years and six hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, it, it's hard because I think the the salary cap has been and raised just with the the bargaining agreement. So six fifty, maybe not as much as what it would have been mm. a few years ago. So. Oh, it's a really tough one. I would just love to see him play just because yeah. he's been through there for a long time and just didn't have any success and really worked his ass off for the club. But, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I'm still torn on it, to be honest. Yeah. But, yeah, probably it's fair to let him go. But, mm. um, yeah, Tom, Tom will tell with this one as well. If he goes on to absolutely kill it at Port Adelaide, then... We'd probably go, oh, we probably should have coughed up the, the extra Fucked money. Up, but yeah. he, he has had injury problems in the last couple of years, which, which has held him back. And Well, I think- that's the basis behind my thinking. Like, I'm in the firm, club did the right thing here, camp, just because, like, he has struggled significantly to get on the park in the last few years. Like, played 
well throughout the season with the shoulder injury this year, but has a history of back problems and hasn't played every game for about four years now, I think. Um, so I think offering a 28-year-old four years would have been pretty irresponsible. I think, yeah, you're right. I think past management probably would have done that. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know if there's still a rule. Actually, there wouldn't be because Luke Hodge just signed a two-year deal. But it used to be like a club rule that past 30, you only get one-year deals. Mm. Um, so that's obviously not the case anymore, but whatever. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty comfortable with how they handled it and getting pick 18 at the time sat well with me. But, yeah, since the Motlop thing came out, definitely was a bit of a kick in the teeth. But it is yeah, what it definitely. is. Um, not Just shifting away from a Brisbane focus for a minute, pretty surprised Port have the salary cap to do what they've done this off-season. Like, the last few seasons been pretty well documented that they were like bursting at the seams in terms of their salary cap and what they had to do um they did actually get rid of a few big contracts this year like Jackson Trengove was apparently on a good wicket there and walked to the Bulldogs and they got rid of Matthew Loby in the end but still to bring in three free agents who would be on pretty decent money is a bit of a surprise for me big surprise and like you said, they have got rid of a few guys. They got rid of Aaron Young as well. And oh, yeah, um, I think Logan Austin went to St Kilda. So they that did. Archie fella as well. Archie as well, yeah. So they did get rid of a few, but <laughs> not going to be anywhere near what mm. um, Rockcliffe, Motlop are, are going to be worth. So, yeah, I'm surprised by that as well because they're going to be paying good money to guys like Paddy Ryder, yeah. Gray, Boak. Ollie Wines, Wingard, mm. you know, some of those names, they'd be on pretty good money. So, mm. yeah, it's a really good point about the salary cap and maybe watch this space at Port Adelaide. Um, they've sort of done a Brisbane 2009 and gambled on, you know, improving their finals position like we did under Voss. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see how they went, especially considering they didn't beat a top eight team all year, which has been well documented. But good luck to them, I guess, and we don't have to death ride them like we did this year, which was actually pretty enjoyable in the end, I found. It was fun. Yeah, it was. It was fun having a team to, to ride to the end. <laughs> anyway, the other big name we lost, huge name, Josh Shackey, in what seemed like the 11th hour, um, ended up losing him for picks, I think it was 25 and something in the... 40. 40? Yeah, 40, exactly. Um, yeah, just this whole side has been so draining as a fan, to go from Willy Wony sign to him signing till still after that constant speculation about him potentially moving till every day of the trade period until, yeah, the 11th hour, just probably when we all thought, oh, yeah, we're going to be fine, and he was gone. But, um, yeah, a huge blow to lose a pick two from two years ago for a bit of change in the second and third rounds. Oh, um, it really is. And you just think what you have to go through to get a top draft pick like that, to get pick two. Mm. We lost 18 games that season, just went through hell. And I think the worst thing about it is all the talk around Josh Shackey was his father played for Brisbane. He really wanted to go there. He was set on going to the club and sticking out for the long haul. And now he's gone after two years and we've only got, picks 25 and 40 in return. It just mm. seems like absolute peanuts. And in a softish draft as well, I, I just find it extraordinary that we'd get rid of him this year. If things didn't work out next year, Hodge comes to the club, maybe takes on a mentor role yeah. for Josh, then maybe part with some picks in a, a better draft bowl report. So it's really shattering to see him go like this. Mm. And... I, even in hindsight, I, I think the Charlie Cameron one, I, I was still filthy about it at the start and I've calmed on that one. But the Josh Shackey one, it still hurts. It, mm. it really is not a good feeling. And I think back to when we tried to trade Bradshaw and Risky Risk Tally as part of the, the Feb deal and I get that same sort of feeling just with this. It just yeah. it doesn't sit right. But I know Josh does have a few, few issues off the field and, yeah, he was obviously dealing with the homesickness and... Mm. Uh, there's all these reports about does he even have the mental aptitude to, to play AFL footy and does he really want it enough? 
And only time will tell with that. I, I'm still uncertain. But he has the talent. It's just, yeah, the mental side of his game. It was actually interesting moments before I called you. There was a video put up by the, the Bullies with an interview from Josh. And he actually said, you know, that's something I have to work on, the mental side of my, my footy, which is something I found interesting that he specifically referenced. Because I suppose from a fan point of view, it's something we've all sort of speculated and talked about is, is that, that side of him up to scratch in terms of being a professional footballer. So for him to say that was pretty confronting. But... um. I think what makes this deal a bit more palatable is we managed to turn some of those picks into 15. Doesn't seem too bad. It sort of cushions the blow a bit. But, yeah, I'm with you. I would have hung on for at least another year, tried to make it work, even if that meant, you know, him spending more time in Seymour during the year, like, whatever, yeah. just go home. Um, yeah. I mean, my thinking now is they re sign him to get, bang for their buck at the trade table, but they haven't actually done that. <laughs> Not even close. Um, yeah, I don't know. It is really frustrating. And I think the more you look into it, like, as you said, his dad played for the club and he was really keen to get up here, but taking a few picks later was a guy that barracked for the club, Clayton Oliver, who's pretty much set the world on fire this season. Just to think to have him... In oh, I don't want to right. think about that. Yeah. <laughs> I do not want to think about that. It hurts a lot. It it hurts. It really hurts. Um, and, yeah, I don't know how you feel, but I just thought these days were behind us. Like, I thought we had this sort of thing settled. I do think Josh is a pretty rare case. Like, I wouldn't, yeah, he is. I no, he is for sure. I wouldn't bundle this into the go-home five discussion no. at all. You can't. But it is still frustrating. You think, oh, okay, we've turned this corner and still... Still, this can happen, but um, yeah. Good luck to him. Hope he does well. Hope he, you know, sorts out everything he needs to sort out. But yeah, can't help but feel we've been shortchanged here. Um, I think what else this deal says is, you know, picks twenty five and forty to get rid of him so lightly. The club must have been really concerned with some of the stuff that was happening, and I think Noble said like publicly. You know, you signed a deal, but at some point in the future, we still feel like you're going to come home. Yeah. So I think there was just enough concerns there that the club just had to get rid of him. And I think at the end of the day, even if he signed for another, if he stayed, sorry, for another year, we would have had 12 more months of just relentless willy wony speculation, watching every one of his moves, which A, isn't good for him and his well being, but B, just not good for the club complete distraction no, that we not. don't need and you know you think about the players like they're trying to live their lives and they get stopped on the corner every day saying oh you know what's happening with josh just yeah i'm i'm kind of glad in a small way that this distraction's gone it's the bulldog's problem now because mm. yeah he's back in victoria but the media speculation won't go away about him because he's in melbourne yeah, no, that spotlight's going to shine. Where AFL is <laughs> everything. Mm. He's up in Brisbane. He's been away from a bit. I know he's been everywhere still, but I think that's probably still going to be the case when he, he's at the Dogs. Uh, they're a bit of a big club now, and the, the focus has been on them, obviously, mm. since they win the Premiership and everything like that. So, yeah, I think the Lions, like the club was very concerned, and especially not playing the Neffel Grand Final. Mm. Like the, They've been working with him throughout those issues, but for him to say, I want to go home, I don't want to play the Neeful Grand Final, that would have just absolutely sounded alarm bells. And I believe that he did say something along the lines of, yeah, I didn't come up here to play twos footy, I came up here to play senior footy. So that was one of the reasons, one of the excuses he used for actually, um, yeah, not playing. So yeah, that's, that's a big call. And Mm. that's, that would have definitely sounded alarm bell. So they've um, been working with him. They've tried, but yeah, I would have loved to see them stick out another year. But yeah, like you said, the, the media speculation, it's not our problem anymore. Mm. And it, it is probably good for the club overall, but we would have loved to get a bit more from him. I don't know how you feel, but I'm not in any way angry at the club. Like in this case, I truly think the club went above and beyond for Josh Shackey to make him fit in. Yeah. To do everything right by him, it just hasn't worked out. I think 
you know, there's no concerns in terms of this being an ongoing issue and losing Victorians or whatever to homesickness. Yeah, I think this is just an isolated thing. Um, on top yeah, of that, it's a diff- different case. Yeah. yeah, on top of that, without I think we've almost speculated too much about the mental side of things going on here. But I think it is interesting that he goes to the Bulldogs, who have Tom Boyd, Travis Cloak. And I think there was another one that struggled with it this year alone, not only... Yeah, someone retired at the start of the season. Who was that? I don't remember. Oh, he, he, was, a, he was a rookie that hadn't yeah. played a game. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I do remember that. But yeah, a club that has a history of, of struggling in this department, it's going to be really interesting to watch from afar how it unfolds. Um, but anyway, we'll move on from that. To loss, we would have liked to see him be, you know, a ten-plus year forward for us, but it's not to be. Um, we now shift our attention to the draft, armed with picks one, fifteen, eighteen, and a few picks that will likely end up being Connor Ballenden. Are you much? Are you going to stick your head out and say who you'd prefer to take pick one, just to wrap up this podcast? I'm not a big fan of the draft and speculating because it is. It's not a lottery, but mm. you just don't know what you're going to get with yeah. some of these kids. And um, there's been a lot of talk about Rayner, and mm. he's come out and said publicly he's more than happy to to come to the Lions and yeah. everything like that. But we've, <laughs> we've heard that before, haven't we? Yeah. Well. But, yeah. Um, there's Dow in the the discussion as well. Mm. So yeah, I I think they might not go towards Rayner. Just yeah, I get that feeling the, as well. The, the murmurings around him that he might be more of a, a Melbourne person that would want to stick around. So it, it's hard to really know. But there's, I think Dow's probably in the conversation. We might go with him at one. Yeah, I would have said Dow. Or Luke Davies, Uniac's probably the other one that I personally like at number one. But yeah, we'll wait and see. Um, anything else you want to throw in before we wrap up? Yeah, just... We're talking about the go home factor before, and just Mick Luggage coming into next season. That's going to be well interesting. Or good point because not only is he out of contract, and so is Witherden, but Mick Luggage has the same manager as Shaki, and we've talked about this throughout the year. But I still feel like the manager played things terribly with how he sort of managed Josh throughout the year. And yeah, he did. So wait and see what happens with you. Hopefully it's a bit more straightforward, but I keep hearing good things about Hugh. I feel like he's really settled, and I think the you know picking him up and Barry with that combination yeah. has really worked in in our favour. So it'd be interesting to see this draft if we do something similar. But um, yeah, I'm probably not worried about Hugh. But then again, I probably wasn't worried about Josh at this time last year either. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't either. But um, yeah, with Witherden as well, I think. Hopefully, we're pretty safe there. I'm hearing pretty good reports about him mm, I think too. So The frustrating thing is they get, the Victorian clubs are going to come and they're going to come hard. Yeah. Just got to back in the system. In fags, we trust. Yep. Hodgie will get around the boys. <laughs> That's it. All right, mate. Good talking to you. And we might do another post-draft maybe podcast just to, just to wrap up the season. A neat little package. Yeah, sounds good, Kegs. All right, mate, see ya.